Good evening, Trailhead and Riverside Church. Good to be with you again this Wednesday night. And um, as we are accustomed to doing, before we dive into God's Word once again, let's stand together and let's uh, recite Shema. We'll do the Hebrew responsively. You see it there in blue. And then we'll recite the English together as a way to, out loud, give our testimony of who we are and what we're doing here as followers of Jesus. Please say these words after me. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Ve'ahavta et Adonai Eloweka, Behol Levavka, Uvahol Nafshecha, Uvahol Meodecha. Uvea hafta reacha kamocha. Amen. Together in English, please. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Amen. Please, you may be seated. This week, uh, we're very nearly upon Ascension Day. And uh, so I'd like to take a look at, through Hebrew Eastern eyes, the amazing story that we have of Jesus' ascension. For that, we're going to turn in the Bible at first to Acts chapter 1. Acts, uh, one of my favorite books in all the Bible, certainly the New Testament, doesn't often get uh, a lot of attention from teaching, let alone preaching, but... um, One of my favorite books to spend some time in, in fact, if we continue beyond our summer series that begins in a couple of weeks, if we continue on into the fall, one of the things I'd consider doing is preaching or teaching through Acts with you through Hebrew eyes, but we'll see um, how that goes. But um, for tonight at least, we're going to just get into the tip of the iceberg that is Acts. Acts, of course, a whopping 28 chapters. It is the longest book in the New Testament. And um, I'm excited to even be experiencing a little bit or a taste of Acts with you tonight. We may also be in Acts next week when I had planned to do Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, although I've been invited to preach on May 31 which is Pentecost Sunday. So I'll have to talk with Riverside. Maybe we'll bring a Pentecost sermon on May 31, Pentecost Sunday, and I'll do something different Wednesday night. But one way or the other, we're going to be in the first couple of chapters of Acts. Um, Acts, uh, Acts of the Apostles is what Acts is short for, Acts of the Holy Spirit Man, the whole book, even if we don't get to do it all one day, just this riveting, adventurous tale. And it's really there, poised soon after the Gospels, um, to offer us really an amazing picture of who we are as Christians and the church and what it is that we're doing here. One theme that uh, I'll introduce this morning, or this evening, excuse me, and um, we'll develop more even next week, but uh, you should certainly take this theme for any reading that you do in Acts, and that's the theme of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven plays a pivotal role in the life and witness of Christians, And it's not just after we die or go to heaven, but actually as it's intended in Scripture, intended by God right now as an integral part of the Christian mission. John the Baptist really introduces the New Testament with his message of repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. You remember John. And his teaching is often quoted, repent For the kingdom of heaven is near, if you want to summarize what John the Baptist was teaching. But did you also catch and have you noticed that as soon as John the Baptist is put into prison, did you notice 
Jesus takes the same theme. Did you ever notice that? Matthew 4, verse 17 tells us, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So it shouldn't be any wonder that if John the Baptist preached the kingdom of heaven, and if Jesus preached the kingdom of heaven, that Luke the friend of the Apostle Paul and author of Acts might also take up this same kingdom of heaven theme. And so, in my opinion, one purpose, at least, of the book of Acts is, number one, to present a compelling picture of the kingdom of heaven, and two, challenge the church, challenge the people of God to fully accept the mission of bringing the kingdom of heaven to a world that is desperate for it. Um, Some background, additional background on the book of Acts. While the author is technically anonymous, Luke is almost universally credited with being the author of Acts. Acts really is a sequel to Luke's gospel. Both letters are written to a man named Theophilus, Many have the book of Acts written about 62 A.D. Some suggest it was much later, but the evidence favoring an early date is pretty strong. Things like Luke in Acts doesn't mention Paul's trial in Rome or his eventual death, which historians place around 67 A.D. And it doesn't mention any of Paul's letters written in the mid-60s, And it doesn't mention the destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70 A.D. The reasoning is that if any of those things had happened prior to Luke writing the book of Acts, he would have mentioned them. It's an argument from silence, but in this case, I think a pretty compelling one. Most scholars recognize that the book of Acts is divided into two main parts. The first 12 chapters really highlight Peter and the Christian mission to the Jews in Israel. And then the second half-ish, chapters 13 through 28, the Apostle Paul takes the four, and that second half of Acts covers the Christian mission to the Gentiles, uh, to the Jew first and then the Gentile. In that first section, the kingdom of heaven, it really comes to bear on the religious and political leadership in Israel, which we'll see already beginning next week. And in the second section, the kingdom of Acts comes to bear on Caesar and Rome. And if we ever get a chance, we'll talk more about that if we delve further into the book. Okay. Your Bibles are open, I hope, to Acts chapter 1. If not, uh, I'll have them on the screen. I will uh, read just the first 12 verses, Acts 1, beginning at verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be immersed, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? His disciples still have that on their mind. Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but... You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. These are the very words of God. Amen? Now, go ahead, if you have your Bibles, keep your finger uh, in your Bibles at Acts 1, and flip back also to Luke 24, the end of that chapter, Luke 24, 50 to 53. It's the last four verses where our same author, Luke, gives us a much shorter account than the one he wrote about in Acts 1, but it has a couple of additional interesting details. Luke chapter 24. Here's what Luke says. When he, Jesus, had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. We'll come back to that in a minute. And they stayed continually at the temple praising God. These two, the very words of God. Amen? Amen. Now, I'd like to dive into our study of Acts by looking in particular at that last verse in the Gospel of Luke or the last two verses at least, especially where we're told that after Jesus ascended, the disciples returned to Jerusalem with great joy and stayed continually at the temple praising God. Now, we read through that. We, of course, know the rest of the story up until today, Great joy in praising God certainly seems appropriate with that 2020 hindsight. But put yourself in the shoes of those disciples near Bethany on the Mount of Olives that day. Does that seem at all odd to us that they would react to Jesus leaving <laughs> with great joy and praising God continually? I mean, Picture it. You and I are Jesus' disciples. We've just spent the past three years together with him, just hanging on his every word, every action, seeing the kingdom of heaven in action, loving him in a way that only a rabbi's tell me deem disciples could love a teacher. And then, just a few days before, you experience, we experience that gut-wrenching disaster of the arrest, the trial, the flogging, and the crucifixion. And we spend a Friday night and Saturday that we'll never, ever forget in shock. It, despair doesn't even cover it. We couldn't even eat or sleep, I imagine, because it is all over. It's done. Everything he said, everything that you believed, gone. And then while we're huddled somewhere in our disastrous depression, there's a footstep in the alley outside the house where we're hiding. Hiding for fear of our own lives even. Shh, what was that? Wondering now if Pilate or the Sanhedrin had sent a Roman soldier to come and get you. Are they coming for us now? Because he's dead. And he's gone. And then, <laughs> oh my goodness, he's alive. He's back. And everything he said just comes streaming back to you. 
And then suddenly there he stands in the room. Oh my goodness, the joy and the light that just came bursting through our despair and the darkness. He's alive. He's alive. Welcome back, Rabbi. Welcome home. What on earth just happened? Tell us, tell us, tell us. Because he's there now again, alive. And so we're so sure, we're so sure now of the answer that we can taste it. And so we ask him the question again that we've been longing for since we've been little knee-high Jewish boys and girls for the ladies with us tonight. And we're sure that the answer is going to be yes. And so we ask him the question, Lord, is it now? Is it now that the kingdom of heaven is going to be restored to Israel? Now's the time. Let's go get the Romans. Is it now? And Jesus says, I'll paraphrase, not exactly. And then he leaves. Now let me ask you, would your reaction be one of great joy and praising God? He's gone again. See, I don't think mine would be. I think I'd be sad. I think I'd be confused. I don't think I'd be glad. If I was Peter, I might say, hey, John, what just happened? Where'd he go? Did he just leave? I'm never going to figure this out. But opposite of that, our text says they reacted with great joy and praising God. Why, do you suppose? Why would they react with great joy? That he left. Now, I've got five suggestions, and I want to use this as a window to unpack some things that A Jewish person, someone who would take the time to dig a bit and look at the story through Hebrew eyes might see more easily than I as a Westerner might, just on first reading. Now, each of these five suggestions could be a sermon or message in its own, so I've condensed it considerably. But see what you think. Could these reasons possibly be why the disciples reacted to Jesus leaving them with great joy and praising God when they had just gotten him back? See what you think. One reason I think they may have reacted with great joy is that Jesus raised his hands to bless them. And you say, well, okay, what's the big deal? Well... Luke 24 tells us that as he was ascending, Jesus raised his hands to bless the disciples. We'll ask them one day, but every bit of study I've done is this likely would have shocked those disciples. Why? Because only priests were supposed to raise their hands and bless. I don't think any other time that Jesus had blessed the disciples, he would ever have raised his hands that was reserved for the priest. So maybe, was Jesus in raising his hands, telling his disciples now that he is the one and only and true and final high priest? He's the one who's going to bring their cause and case before his Father in heaven. Brief P.S. here. It's fascinating to note that Luke opens his gospel with the account of Zechariah. Remember Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad. Zechariah was a priest. And while he was in the Holy of Holies on a high holy day, an angel came and told him that he and Elizabeth would have a son. We know that son became or was John the Baptist. Anyway, when Zechariah didn't believe the angel Gabriel, the angel told Zechariah that he wouldn't be able to speak 
until John was born. Now, when I, the very first time I ever read that verse, even as a small boy, I thought, well, that's an interesting thing to lay on Zechariah. I, you know, the angel just kind of pulled into his bag and got, well, what are we going to do to Zechariah? Because he doesn't believe the message of the angel. Ah, uh, let's see. We could cause him to limp. No, we could uh, do something. I, I know. Let's just pick this one. You know, you won't be able to speak. I don't think so. Here's why I think the angel and God chose that for Zechariah. This was a huge problem for Zechariah. Because what he's supposed to do, as soon as he comes out of the Holy of Holies, as the go-between intercessor between the people who are waiting and praying while he's in the Holy of Holies, wondering if he's going to come out alive, what he's supposed to do as God's representative, he was supposed to come out and raise his hands and say the blessing of the High Holy Day. Only this time he couldn't. Now, that's a big problem. I picture Zechariah. I'd like to talk, talk with him about it someday. It had to be something. He comes out of there, and I don't know, did he realize right away he couldn't speak? I think the angel probably told him that. I don't know if he tested it, but out he comes. All of Israel gathered on that temple mount, ready to hear him bless. I wonder if he even tried. Raised his hands and opened his mouth to give the blessing. Nothing. Those of you who speak or teach or preach, or I see Ethan here, those of you who sing, that's one of those nightmares that a speaker, teacher, performer has like the time before they go on. That they're going to get up there and they won't be able to say anything or they'll forget the note. I feel for Zechariah. He comes out of there that day and I could see the fellow priest going, what is up with him? Rick, somebody else say the blessing. Anyway, don't miss Luke opens his gospel with a priest who cannot bless the people, and he ends his gospel with Jesus raising his hands and blessing them instead. And I wonder if the disciples caught it. I'll bet they did. We'll ask them one day. And if they did, that would be a reason for great joy and praising God. Even though Jesus left, Maybe it dawned on him that Jesus was now God's appointed intercessor on their behalf. It wasn't the high priest anymore. And come on, Jesus would have been a dramatic improvement for the disciples, right, over Caiaphas, who had just put Jesus to death. I wonder if that was a source of great joy. A second possible reason. See what you think about this one. In Matthew, we get what we know as the Great Commission. I think I have it marked here for those of us who need a reminder. Um, here's Matthew's Great Commission. This was not said uh, on the Mount of Olives at the Ascension. Some people get that a little bit confused. But it wasn't uh, too much longer before that Jesus said these words. I, oh, I do have it marked. Here it is. It's when they were in Galilee. When they saw him, Jesus, the disciples worshipped him, some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, why might that have at least contributed that day a few days later to great joy even though Jesus was leaving? Well, not only has Jesus just stepped into and indicated that he's the one and only new high priest, see the book of Hebrews, but God has also given him all authority. The Hebrew word for authority, shmicha, say shmicha. We don't have time to unpack shmicha. Maybe we will one day. I may have mentioned it when we were talking about discipleship. 
But this too, the fact that Jesus would have been given all authority, all shmicha, is fantastic news. Because as a follower of Jesus, for those disciples, this just clenches it for them. The one who intercedes for us to God has been given complete authority by God on what to do. Our rabbi Jesus isn't only intercessor, he's also judge and jury. He's our advocate, judge, and jury, all our beloved rabbi. Now, that's a reason, I think, if it dawned on the disciples that way, as I think it might have, for them to have great joy, even though they just lost him again for the second time in 40 days. And it keeps getting better. What do you think about this one, this next one, as a cause for great joy? There's something called apotheosis. Say apotheosis. It literally means up and then theosis, God. But apotheosis is the Greek term for a common Roman practice. Here's what Rome said. By law, Rome had developed a practice founded in Roman law It was there in the first century, a well-known practice of giving Caesar divine status when Caesar died. And part of that practice called apotheosis, here's what needed to happen for Caesar to be declared a god um, on his death. There needed to be about 12 witnesses who said and testified in the Roman Senate that they saw Caesar ascend to heaven. Now, if the disciples knew of that commonly known practice, I think they may have. There's about 12 of them seeing Jesus ascend into heaven. Saying, under Roman law, no doubt, that he's now God. Now, a couple of things there. Those disciples don't need the Roman law or apotheosis to show them that Jesus is God. They've had plenty of experience of that. But what a powerful story for a disciple of Jesus to tell a Roman and Gentile world who knew and believed in that apotheosis practice. You could stump, you play stump a Roman as they went out into the world, and you could tell the story. Hey, and not only that, about 12 of us saw him ascend to heaven. And for the Roman to dispute that that meant anything, meant for them to dispute what Caesar and the Roman um, Senate had decided. It's really funny, I think, Um, and so telling how God can use a however um, pagan practice, however a secular practice like the apotheosis of Caesar, what the enemy, I'm sure, intended to confuse people, how God can use that very practice to affirm that Jesus himself is God. I love that, and I wonder if the disciples started getting and understanding that oh my goodness he's our intercessor oh my word he's been given all authority he gets to decide and oh i can't wait to tell my roman friend up the street that i saw him ascend about 12 of us and that he's very god that might get my juices flowing and might cause me great joy and praising god for that valuable witness tool to tell the apotheosis story i don't know what do you think we'll ask them one day How about this one as a cause for great joy? A new promised land. Um, What I have here, and I'll try to do it briefly, um, I want to take a look at with you um, a comparison between Joshua 1, the first nine verses, and that great commission in Matthew 28. Listen first, I don't have it on a slide for you, but listen first 
to um, God's words in the book of Joshua. And I have them here somewhere. Or is that the one that I didn't? I will find it. Go ahead, you can race me to the book of Joshua. (laughs) I'm sure you've all beaten me by now. Joshua is in the Bible, right? Oh, here it is. Check it out. First nine verses, Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory is going to extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Does that sound at all familiar? Familiar to the Great Commission? Did those disciples who knew Joshua one by heart from elementary school, did they hear the promise in Joshua 1 repeated that day and those days between Jesus' resurrection and ascension? Jesus said, we'll make disciples of all nations. Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And I'll be with you always. And also even repeated, make sure you teach them to obey. I wonder if the disciples caught it. And I wonder if they thought something like, hey, God made a similar promise to Joshua, and we ended up with the promised land. Now we're hearing from our intercessor, high priest, divine God himself, that not only are we going to get the promised land, we're going to get the whole world. And if God promised Israel to the Israelites and came through, Won't he keep his promise again? The whole world is out there for us. I wonder if they caught the vision and the mission. Great joy and praising God. Last, take another reason for great joy that day, even though Jesus was leaving. And really, there's two for one here. I could have done six, but I ran out of room on the slide, so (laughs) just five. Um, Jesus says, I'll be back. And he promises that the Holy Spirit will come if they just go back to Jerusalem and wait for him. And the Holy Spirit will come on them. They'll be baptized, immersed in the Holy Spirit with power. Maybe we can understand more of why the disciples reacted to Jesus leaving them with great joy and praising God. Jesus is our priest, our intercessor. And not only that, God gave Jesus the authority to decide what happens. And not only that, Jesus is God himself, as even Roman law affirms. And not only that, God promises he's going to give his people the world, just like he promised the land of Israel. And finally, God promises power in the Holy Spirit until the day that Jesus comes back. Now, we tend to think of the Holy Spirit as a post-Pentecost experience for those who know God and follow Jesus only. Now, 
It was taken to a whole new level, yes. But these disciples, well-versed in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, they understood Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh. They understood what was called in the Scriptures often the Spirit of the Lord. They knew the story of Samson, of what happened when the power of Ruach HaKodesh came on someone. They knew the stories of the prophets, Elijah, Elisha, and others, who with the power of the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, they could perform miracles like no other. I wonder if one reason for great joy and praising God was because that prophet, that judges, that Ruach HaKodesh Holy Spirit was going to be given to them too in a new amazing way. Go to Jerusalem and you guys are going to get that power too. Wow! And yet, there they sat looking intently up into the sky. This is before the great joy in praising God. Trying in vain to maybe see him through the cloud. Everything he just said, maybe it's still getting into them and they haven't realized it yet, because there they just sit staring into space. Reminds me of a joke. Uh oh. A man out taking a walk spotted a farmer standing in the middle of a wheat field looking intently up into the sky. Are you okay, he asked the farmer. Certainly, replied the farmer. I'm just trying to win a Nobel Prize. How are you going to do that, asked the man. Well, he replied, I read the other day that to win the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize, you have to be outstanding in your field. I can hear the laughter rippling back through the Internet. Go ahead, you can use that joke if you want or not. (laughs) I imagine Jesus ascending into the throne room of God the Father that day, running to his Father for perhaps the biggest hug of all time. And then maybe noticing that his Father's looking down to earth where a group of young men are sitting there staring up into space. What are they doing, maybe Jesus asked. Well, they're just standing there, God replies. Trying to win a Nobel Prize? Uh Uh-huh. Jesus grins because it's funny. The Father (laughs) smiles too. And maybe God the Father calls out, Michael, Gabriel, whoever the two were, get your robes, the white ones. Go just suddenly just be standing beside those guys and shoo those guys off the Mount of Olives. There's kingdom work to be done. Do you ever find yourself just standing there looking intently up into the sky Staring into space, pining for the day that Jesus will return. Now, please hear me. There is nothing wrong in everything right about longing for the day that Jesus will return. Believe me, I wish he would return right now. And I hope that he returns soon and very soon. So there's nothing wrong with looking for and longing for Jesus' second coming. But while we're doing that, what about the just standing there and doing nothing part? Sometimes as people of God, followers of Jesus, if you're like me, we do that sometimes, don't we? We get stuck in neutral, staring into space. Maybe we grow content to nurture, to only nurture our own personal faith and salvation while the world and people around us cry out in so many different ways for help. We get caught, don't we sometimes, standing in the middle of a wheat field of people needing the Lord, standing in the middle of a wheat field ripe for harvest, just standing there staring into space. Man, if we can just hang on until the rapture, if we just hang on until Jesus comes again, all the rest of it just takes so much time, it takes so much money. Where are we going to get the money? 
And now this virus that's going on, I'm not going out there, are you kidding me? How often do we forget that we're on mission and that life is not some sort of vacation? Sure, God gave us life in a beautiful place to live in for our enjoyment and pleasure. Yes, enjoy it. Praise the Lord. But that's not why we're here. We're on mission. Our mission is to bring the kingdom of heaven to a hurting world. Now, we can take some comfort in the fact that at first, even those 11 disciples seem to be stuck in neutral too. Even with Jesus' assuring words still ringing in their ears, there they sit, staring into space. Scripture tells us two angels came down and they say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taking from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. I know I need that gentle reminder from time to time. Do you? Or maybe sometimes a not so gentle reminder. Do we need be reminded that we follow a savior who is god himself do we need to be reminded that he promised us the world all the nations in his name do we need to be shooed from our fortress churches on mountaintops to get out into the world and oh yeah do we need to know and remember that god is not only with us but in us And instead, sometimes we stare in neutral. Earlier, I suggested to you that one purpose of the book of Acts, one, present a compelling picture of the kingdom of heaven. Two, challenge the people of God to fully accept the mission of bringing the kingdom of heaven to a world desperate for it. Well, the compelling picture Luke opens with in this first chapter chapter of Acts is that when we're doing kingdom of heaven work, God is on our side. And next week, one way or the other, whether when um, we look at Pentecost, we'll see that God is not only on our side, but that we have him inside. And so since we have God on our side and inside, what are we waiting for? Why do we so often hesitate? Come on, let's go. Luke reminds us that God is on our side, challenges us to come down from our Mount of Olive tops, bring the kingdom of heaven to a world desperate for it, and continue to do so until the day he comes again. That's our mission, to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. How do we accomplish it? Well, we have God on our side, but we need to do more than stare into heaven holding on for dear life until Jesus returns, don't we? We need to do more than be outstanding in our field. We need to be outstanding in our field, our field of God's love, grace, compassion, forgiveness, and peace. If we continue to study Acts beyond next week, or when you do so another time perhaps, you'll see Luke continues to give in that amazing book all sorts of details on this business of bringing God's kingdom to the world. But for now, by way of our passage this evening, Luke begins in Acts by reminding us that God's with us, and as we come down from our mountaintops and into a desperate world, he promised it was there for us to take. So come on, let's go get it. Let's go together with God into the world with the good news about Jesus in the kingdom. The only question is, are you willing to come? Are you willing to go? A couple of PSs, coronavirus is here. I read a couple of days ago that the United Nations released a report and a study putting the world on notice and alarm and begging for help. Because of the coronavirus, most notably because of the economic collapse that it's caused, 125 to 130 million more people will struggle with hunger and starvation in the coming months and years ahead. 
That's double what the normal annual number is. Wouldn't it be something if the church stood into that gap? If the people of God took that cause up? If you need somewhere or something to give to, maybe give to, find those organizations that are there and are now desperate for help to feed the hungry. I heard a story the other day. There's so many dominoes that fall when the economy fails. I heard a story. My wife and I sometimes go to Puerto Vallarta. There's a condo that great friends of us let us use. It's right on the ocean. We were going to go in July. It got canceled, of course. And one story from a friend out of Puerto Vallarta, the people getting hit hardest in Puerto Vallarta are the homeless and the poor, the really, really wretched, very poor. Because how they ate, how they found food to eat, is they would go out onto the beaches and this is throughout Mexico, and they would collect all the plastic bottles that tourists would leave behind, turn that in, and that was enough for them to be able to buy food to eat. No tourists, no plastic bottles, no food. How can we help? How can we help? Will we, at a time when the inclination is, whew, with the economy being where it is, I better hang on to my stuff and my money. Will we be countercultural in that way as the people of God and make sure we step up even more? And in doing so, testify to who God is and make sure that the poor who are bearing the brunt of this thing, more than any of us, I would guess, certainly anyone who's listening to me now, beginning with me, Wouldn't it be something if that's what the people of God were known for coming out of this thing or in and out of this thing? That man, those Jesus followers, look at them. They're giving at an unprecedented level to care for those who are hurting. Now that's catching the spirit of Luke in Acts chapter 1. That's understanding how valuable the kingdom of heaven is. That's bringing the kingdom of heaven to a world that is desperate for it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we've been able to spend, however virtually, that we've been able to spend in your timeless, matchless word. Father, thank you for Luke and inspiring him and giving him the words to put down this amazing story of Jesus' ascension. Jesus, thank you for your encouragement to your followers that day that even though you were leaving and were no longer physically present with them, the words that promised power and presence and intercession and paving the way to make it happen that caused great joy and eagerness and excitement in those young men. Lord, may the same be said for us too today. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. I'll see you again next week. Have a great week.